Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, we take you to a facility whose main goal is to eliminate some of the most deadliest animals in the world. And you've likely been bit by one before. It's called the shark's tooth capital of the world, but that's not all you'll find here in the water. And they are considered the slowest moving mammals on Earth. What can it be? This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Animal Outtakes. I'm Marsha Panucci and this is my best friend, Zeus. This is a pest you don't want anywhere near you. That's because their main diet is blood. And it may surprise you, one county has an entire team dedicated to tracking and eliminating these pesky little vampires. What is really involved in this lab? What are we going to be looking at? So for the most part, we're going to be looking at different populations of mosquitoes that we've trapped. So we're going to have several that are spread out throughout the county and we're going to be identifying each mosquitoes to preferably species. And then we also have a disease surveillance lab as well where we'll be, where we'll be able to monitor what types of disease, if any, there are in the populations in Sarasota County. The peak season is generally from May to October, so that's when we're mostly the busiest and that's when we have the heaviest bags for the most part. So Taylor, this is a very tedious task. I mean, uh, you have to have a lot of patience. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. So tell us what's going on here. Walk us through. I mean, obviously we have a lot of dead mosquitoes. Yes. You're also going to have other dead insects. So our first step is to dump the bags out and kind of spread them out so that we can pick out any larger insects, like if you've got beetles or something like that. And then once we get it down to just what we can see to be mosquitoes, we get them in a line so that it's easier to count them. And then you just kind of pull it underneath the scope and go mosquito by mosquito. Where have these been collected from? Today, I think we have some from mainly in urban Sarasota and then also rural Sarasota. So these mosquitoes are trapped in some device? Yes, they're trapped in, um, it's a CO2 baited trap. So it's got a funnel with a fan, a light, and then it's also attached to a CO2 tank. So it emits CO2 to attract the mosquitoes. And then once they're attracted to the general area, they fly towards the light and get sucked down into the funnel. And then the bags are again attached to the funnel, so they drop down into the bags. It does beg the question, they are a terrible nuisance <laughs> to so many, but there, is there an upside to a mosquito? The only thing that I could possibly think of is that some, there is some evidence that they can act as a pollinator because the males and the females feed on nectar from flowers. But for the most part, the possibility of vectoring a disease to a human is a lot more important to consider than it potentially being a pollinator. So again, it's more of a safety hazard for us to not treat mosquitoes in that respect. So definitely the disease vector aspect of it is a little bit more problematic. It requires a lot of patience for sure, um, but again, it's the best way to get an insight on the populations. If you want to treat, you're going to have to do it based on where the mosquitoes are at. So if you've got, you know, let's say a saltwater mosquito, you're not going to be wanting to spray inland areas that are not salt marsh, things like that. And so it really gives us an ability to pinpoint where we want to treat and, you know, whether or not it's important to, if we have high numbers of species that are less likely to bite humans, we might not be as willing to treat. And that's why we have um, specific thresholds based on the zones that the mosquitoes are from, as well as what species they are. Humans, you can go outside when we're spraying and you're not going to be harmed in any way. We also only spray with 0.6 ounces per acre of that chemical or whatever, which one we choose. So again, we also use very specific droplet sizes so that they will pinpoint mosquitoes and larger organisms, they'll kind of skid off of them. So it's very technical approach to using pesticides. And again, we also do resistance testing to ensure that the mosquitoes are not developing a resistance to the chemicals. And that's why we have to kind of differentiate which ones we use so that the mosquito populations are in fact going to be impacted by the chemicals when we do treat. 
What animal causes the most deaths to humans worldwide? You guessed it, mosquitoes. Besides humans, they are the most deadliest animals on Earth. And it is the girl mosquitoes you need to worry about. While males prefer to seek out flour for nectar, the females are the little bloodsuckers. They are the ones that bite in order to help with reproduction. People come from all over the world to visit Venice Beach. It's called the shark tooth capital of the world. We recently showed you how to hunt for these prehistoric fossils, but what we didn't show you is what else is out in the water. The sun, the surf, and the fossils? Venice Beach on the west coast of Florida is known for what beachgoers find in the sand. It's the shark tooth capital of the world. This is the typical what you would find on the beach, these smaller teeth. It is the hunt for ancient treasures that attracts people from all over the world. Still play in the dirt, that's what I tell everybody. I still play in the dirt. And Chuck Ferrara, president of the Southwest Florida Fossil Society, says it's a hobby where you never know what you might discover. It's science, you're learning, um, it's educational. Um, I'm bringing something from the depths that was here millions of years ago. Um, hopefully, um, I find something rare that I can donate to the museum. I do have specimens that I've donated to the Smithsonian and to the Florida Museum that I found. Um, and I, that certificate that you get from the Smithsonian means more to me than anything else. Okay, so Chuck, I'm really excited about this, but what are we going to find? Am I going to find something stupendous or am I going to find something so small? Well, I'm not so sure. We hope we're going to find something stupendous, but you're prob we're probably going to find small. Okay. This is what, if oh, you scuba goodness. dive, oh. this is what you would find if you oh, scuba dive. My, oh my heavens. Oh, oh. That is a Carcarian Megalodon. That is one of the biggest teeth I have found. Found that it, offshore in the clay. It was in the clay layer. Now, how big would this shark have been to have a one tooth like this? One, well, it's an average, but one inch of tooth is equivalent to 10 foot of shark. That's a five and an eighth inch tooth, so it'd have been a 50 foot fish. That was a big boy. Yeah. School bus. <laughs> I, I'm glad they're not around yes. anymore. Oh, this is magnificent. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go for this. I bet you would. <laughs> now, Chuck, this is very, very interesting. First of all, this could be a paperweight. This is so heavy, truly. Yeah, but the interesting thing is, is there are serrated edges on this tooth. Is that common? Yes, yes. You, you want to find them with the serrated edges. This is, called, this is a serrated edge. This is called the burlet, this, this line right here, and this is the root part. Believe it or not, this is the part everybody shows, but that's the reverse side. If you were looking at a shark's mouth, this is what you would see. I see. This is the side you'd see. This is on the inside, but this is the prettier side that everybody wants to show. Now, my father was a dentist. <laughs> so uh, I would say that they don't have dry sockets after oh, they lose this. Oh, no. They They're got another, just fine. There's another tooth right that comes right in and replaces it. And they, sharks lose their teeth when they're feeding. Uh, they're very aggressive when they feed. That's when they lose a lot of their teeth. Sometimes they swallow the teeth. Sometimes the, the nick you see on here, that could have been from feeding, feeding damage, where it bit, the tooth fell out. Maybe they bit or nicked their own tooth. Sharks don't have bones like you and I. Instead, their skeleton is made of cartilage, like our nose or ears. So over thousands of years, a shark's teeth is all that would be left to find. And they have a lot of them. Sharks can lose about 30,000 teeth in their lifetime. Most species have about 15 rows of teeth. One tooth is lined up right behind the other, kind of like a conveyor belt. Once one is lost, another falls right into place. Out here, of course, on the beach, are sharks' teeth the only things that we find here? No, as um, Florida is well known for the Ice Age mammal fossils that we also have found here. We have the best of both worlds here in Florida. You have Venice Beach to scuba dive, but you also have the Peace River uh, inland, which cuts through the Bone Valley Formation, which has a lot of the vertebrae. Mammal ice age mammal fossils that we'll find. Now I know that we're scoping out here for the shark's teeth, but 
Would we find something else? We could. Um, I have diving. I find horse teeth, deer antler, whale rib bones, dugon rib bones, which is ancient manatee, uh, whale vertebrae, uh, reptile vertebrae from alligator or crocodile. Um, you find all of it because it's all out there in that uh, formation, in that ancient river bottom. How old are we here in Florida? Florida is only about 24 million years old. It was just a little just sick. That. <laughs> That's it. Uh, no dinosaurs were ever here. We only had the age of Ice Age mammals. And so treasures are out there. All kinds of interested fossil finds. All you have to do is keep your head down and look. This was so much fun. Talk about finding treasures. The Southwest Florida Fossil Society gives talks and presentations regularly. And if you discover something you need help identifying, they are a great resource as well. There is nothing fast about our next guest. We'll meet Stella the Sloth right after the break. Stick with us. We'll be right back. You can be sure your furry friend continues to be loved and cared for even when you can no longer be there for them. Dante's Den provides a permanent loving home for dogs whose owners have set up a lifetime care program for their beloved companion. We honor the trust placed in us by providing loving care, spacious dens, on-site veterinary care, and plenty of room to run and play. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. Dante's Den, continuing the love. Welcome back. Almost everything about the next animal is slow, from eating foods to even their digestion. No wonder, they're considered the slowest moving mammals on Earth. Well, Danielle, you have a new baby here, and this is Stella. This is Stella the Sloth. And, uh, oh my goodness, how can you not fall in love? I know. She oh. really loves her sweet potatoes, yes, too. Yes, she does. So how old is Stella? She just turned a year old. So she's, um, she's well uh, making her way to being a full-grown sloth. And she came from a private collector. And she came to you as a baby. She did. At six months old, she came from us um, from a, a private collector down in South Florida. And uh, we welcomed her, welcomed her with open arms because uh, we don't have a sloth here at the Big Cat Habitat. And um, she's a super great animal ambassador for us. She's something that we can take out that's safe, that I can handle, <laughs> and that we can talk about her and educate people a little bit more about sloths. Actually, they don't know a lot about sloths in the wild. They actually, um, they don't even keep a record of their count of how many sloths are actually in the wild. So uh, there's still a lot we need to, to learn about these little guys. Now she has some very interesting eyes, Danielle. Yeah. They're a kind of a goldish green. And uh, of course she looks at the world upside down. It's so funny. Yeah, she's, um, they, a lot of sloths are nocturnal. Um, they, um, they say some, some might be diurnal, which is like a daytime dwelling animal. But I find her to be more nocturnal. She does, she's a lot more active at night. Um, she likes to eat more at night and um, she'll climb around her whole enclosure all the way upside down and hang upside down most of the night. And I have to tell you that I was expecting Ooh, that this hair was going to be like a bristly uh, brillo mm -hmm. pad. Yeah. She's as she's soft so, yeah, as she's very soft. Me. She's and the cool part is she, she has, she, this is a two-toed sloth. There are three-toed variety. Look, she doesn't want, she's like, oh, it's cold. And, <laughs> but she has two, two nails on this toe. And she has the three on the back feet. And this is the Linus's two-toed sloth. And she'll be about almost 30, 30 pounds when she is full grown, 20, 20 to 30 pounds, and they say. what is she now? She's probably around 12, maybe 15. Yeah, but she's, she's got some nice she's little, She's got a and little look tummy. At <laughs> look at this right here. And you see how her hair is growing in like the opposite way of like a dog? Yes. You know, dogs kind of grow they down. Grow out. Right, this one kind of grows, because so when she hangs upside down like in a tree, the water would naturally just flow right off of her. Although in the wild, these animals are almost tinted green because they have like this algae that grows on them because they don't move. Now we've always heard slow as a sloth, and I think we're seeing that right now. What are their natural habits? And 
Where do these guys come from? So these guys come from Central America, um, Costa Rica. Um, and the, the three-toed variety actually comes from a small island right off of Costa Rica. And these guys are really slow. Now in the wild, they eat leaves and, 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 and food and, fo and foliage that is not very high in uh, any kind of minerals, vitamins, anything like that. So they naturally in the wild do move so slow. <laughs> but, um, and they only actually come down out of the trees maybe like every 10 days to go to the restroom or bathroom and they do it on the ground floor. They don't poo or pee up in the treetops where they would hang out all day long. But speaking um, of hanging, they hang upside down. They do, and she actually hangs upside down a lot. And um, and it's, it's, it's crazy because you think, oh, they must be slow and weak, but they're not. They have this unbelievable well, grip. Yeah, yeah, she's got a grip <laughs> yeah, here on look, you, she's like, and yeah. she's not going to let go. <laughs> oh, it's just like holding a baby. Right, they're close. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's really cool. And I'm just rocking her. When you think of a parrot, these colorful birds come to mind. Up next, we'll meet the Scarlet Macaw. My life motto is keep moving. And as hard as it was when my husband passed away, I knew I had to keep doing what I love. Oops, coming. But I needed help, help with my insurance, and that's what the NAIC provides. They have resources to help you and your family make the best decision, and they'll help you to keep moving forward, just like me. I'll be right back. Hi. You think you're probably sober? Yeah. But you're thinking about taking the back roads home, just in case. If you're probably sober, then why would you do that? Good choice. Probably okay isn't okay. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. That's a full glass of wine. I'll be chatting you later. Thank you. You got a key? It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. We have all heard a bird repeat words or mimic sounds, but this species of birds not only can talk, but also recognizes shapes and colors. They are considered one of the most intelligent bird species. Rosie. How's our Rosie? This is a scarlet macaw, correct, Stacy? Correct. And uh, she is a character. Yes. Uh, very much so. Huh? Tell us a little bit about this breed. Um, scarlet macaws. Um, <laughs> sometimes good talkers, very personable, as you can say. Um, sometimes known to be nippy. She's a pretty good girl. Um, likes all kinds of fruits, vegetables, nuts. She can correct Brazil nuts all on her own. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> Does she have a vocabulary? She um, barks. Oh, she, she barks. Gives kisses. She says hello. She says come out. And she says hello. Hello. And can, can you, you say hello? Hello. Can you say hello? Say hello. Say hello. Say. Yeah. Oh, there was the hello. That was a good yeah, one. Yeah, it was a and, good one. And where's the dog? Oh. I don't know. Now, is this a good pet? for somebody, the scarlet macaw. They are a good pet for someone that is dedicated. I mean, they need fresh, fresh foods every day. Um, you need to clean every day. Um, wipe down to the caves, you change cage paper every day. Um, they definitely need time outside of their cage. Um, hi. And when you talk about time outside the cage, what are you really talking about? Do you walk around with them? Do you let them fly about? How do you give them that time? Trees like that around your house, um, different play cages around your house. Um, I mean, here in Florida, I have I have bird trees on the lanai so they can go outside and get sunlight. Now, are these birds are still being bred here yeah. in this in the states, oh, maybe yeah. specifically Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, so we can 
say that they're part of the pet trade. Yes. Do you think that they should be part of the pet trade? Mm. Well, if you get yeah. a responsible owner, things are good. Yes, but they outlive people, especially in this area. I mean, all of these birds were probably purchased and they were someone's pet at some point, but now they're here and they don't have any, they don't have a home. Hi. Now, when they have this vocabulary, mm -hmm. is it something that they are picking up ambiently or are yeah. you sitting there repeating words constantly? Both. It depends. It depends on the person. Some people work very hard to train their bird to make it say certain things, you know. They want to say, yeah, you know, I can talk, can you fly? But <laughs> um, a lot of it's ambient. I mean, but Rosie knows that she's a celebrity oh, now, yes. right? There's yeah. the camera, Rosie. Ah, yes, yes, there's the camera, Rosie. Just you know, lots of personality. Um, Do they pick up personality from us? Yes. Oh, yes. I think ah. um, if I'm if I'm here and I'm having a bad day, that's the day I'm going to get bit. If I'm not 100 percent, if I'm stressed, if I'm you know rushing around, that's the day they'll get me. So they're very much tuned in to us. Oh, definitely. Yes. Thanks, Rosie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ah, yes. Scarlet macaws can live more than 75 years in captivity. They can outlive their owners. That's the case with many of the birds at the Parrot Outreach Society. For more information about this organization, visit their website, parrotoutreachsociety.org. ABC 7, your Suncoast News. We're here for you. Watch ABC 7 wherever you are. On our live stream, on mysuncoast.com, on the ABC 7 My Suncoast app. Powered by the I Associates, providing sight for life. Featuring traffic maps and live radar. Dining with recipes and My Suncoast restaurant guide. Visit mysuncoast.com. Click on the Apps tab to download the ABC 7 My Suncoast app for Apple and Android. Many websites selling medication may look professional and legitimate, but the vast majority of sites selling prescription drugs are doing so illegally. Criminals use websites to sell counterfeit medications that may contain life-threatening toxins. Dot Pharmacy is a website verification program that helps you identify safe and trustworthy online pharmacies. Purchasing medicine online can be safe and easy. Just look for pharmacy to the right of the dot in website addresses. protection she has. Buddy up. I'm Jill Harrington. Please visit HelpSaveTheNextGirl.com and get involved. One of the motivating factors for me to uh, become a big brother was that I was mentored as a youth. And it was important for me to kind of pass forward the things that were kind of given to me. It's really just as simple as getting to know a kid. You don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to have any of those other things. You just have to be willing to spend a little time and help mold some young person's life. Thanks for staying with us. What are we going to talk about today, Benson? <gasps> Cats? Dr. Glassman, we as humans are, always seem to be worried about diseases that can be spread from the animals to us. And I understand there is a very important disease that we need to know about for pregnant women. That's true. The disease you're talking about is called toxoplasmosis, and it's an interesting parasite. It's sort of a one-celled microscopic organism. It has a very complex life cycle. But basically, your cat, if your cat gets exposed by eating usually infected meat from an animal it was hunting, or even raw meat that you might have fed it that wasn't cooked properly, and they eat these microscopic uh, infected stages, then they get the infection in their intestinal tract, and then they will shed thousands, if not millions, of microscopic eggs in their feces. Oh dear. So the danger is for a person, which is really not a big danger, because you would have to eat cat feces. Well, 
So don't That's do that. That's not on the menu today. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, and a pregnant woman would have to eat it somehow, fecal matter, if they weren't clean, cleaning the litter box, somehow got it on food or whatever. You would have to eat it in your first trimester of pregnancy, and you would never have to have been exposed before. Actually, about 20% of us as kids probably have eaten it in soil because it's in soil and about 20 percent of the human population tests positive for it because they were exposed somewhere in their past. What about just on your hands as no. you're cleaning? Well, as long as you wash your hands, you know, after you yes. sc uh, scoop the litter box, you're fine. Sure. But also the eggs in the feces have to uh, sit for at least 24 hours to become what's called sporulated and where they would become infective. So theoretically, if you scoop the litter box every day shouldn't be more than 24 hours ideally you'd never be exposed but this also only happens for a short period of time in the cats uh, in the life cycle of the organism let's say a cat let's say putty went out and ate a mouse that had this disease maybe a week later there'd be eggs in the feces but that would only last maybe 10 days or two weeks and then the cat almost never sheds it again so it's a very brief episode for the cat and the likelihood of a person having those chances all add up first time infected for the cat, you eating some infected fecal material. Actually, you're much more likely to get it as a person from eating unwashed vegetables from a garden because of stray cats and feral cats defecating in the garden. Or if you ate undercooked lamb and pork are the two most common for people, I understand, you could eat the infected cysts in the meat. So you can get it more likely, not from your cat, but from other sources in our environment. And so if you suspect that this is gonna happen, what do we do? Well, you can't really worry about it too much because it's just so uncommon in general unless you live in poor areas where pets don't get routine care. Um, and as long as you have clean litter boxes and your cats aren't in and out hunting every day and you, you know, take basic hygiene practices. Actually, uh, gyneco obstetricians often tell people to get rid of their cat because they're pregnant and tell them, no thank you, go to the Cornell Veterinary website. They have excellent information. Everybody should know this. Cornell Veterinary website has a feline health center and the doctor, if they tell you to get rid of your cat, tell them, go to the website to read up about the life cycle that you are very minimally likely to ever be exposed. Well, we're never going to get rid of you, Puddy. Thank you, Dr. Glassman. You're welcome. We hope you've had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. Zeus and I'll be back here again next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. We have all heard a bird repur, repur, repur. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's just like holding a baby. Well, that's good. <laughs> we probably could take the towel away. So you can well, see. let's just keep things away. Let's just are. keep it. <laughs> She's really grabbing my neck. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. 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 But that's okay. food lover, restaurant goer, or home cook? Then check out My Suncoast Dining on MySuncoast.com, your guide to the foodie lifestyle. ABC 7's own Chef Judy serves up her favorite recipes, cooking tips and trends, dining blogs, and helpful step-by-step -step videos. And you'll love the restaurant guide with direct links to your favorite Suncoast eateries. Whether you're cooking in or dining out, whet your appetite with tasty tips from Chef Judy at MySuncoast.com slash dining. My name is Stephen Jaffe. Uh, the law firm's name is Farmer Jaffe. One of the beautiful things about Julius is he's always smiling and it becomes infectious. The fact that Julius has a disability has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of work that he's done. Just a, a great person you want on your staff. Hi, this is Dan Marino. When your business recruits people with disabilities, everybody wins. To find out how, go to abilitieswork.com employflorida.com. Enjoy some of the best Suncoast restaurants on me. Just go to mysuncoast.com slash dining, sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already, and you can win a $50 gift card to a restaurant in our area. We'll pick a winner each week, so go on our website and sign up now. 
Get breaking news alerts focused on the Sun Coast. Download the ABC7 News app. ABC7, the Sun Coast's official Florida lottery station.